You're listening to Collected, stories from the Australian War Memorial. I'm Louise Ma. you might recognise these songs. They were much-loved music hall tunes, which became popular marching songs in the First World War. Soldiers on the Western Front sang them in the trenches, and families back home shared them around the piano. It's a long way to Tipperary and pack up your troubles in your old kit bag are among 100 songs chosen for the Australian War Memorial's special project Music and the First World War. Pack up your troubles in your old kit bag and smile, smile, smile. The Music and the First World War project started at the beginning of the centenary of the First World War period. Teresa Kronk is the senior curator of published and digitised collections. We were talking a lot about music and art at the time and a lot of the research that we were doing, we wanted to make use of it. And it sort of culminated in the idea of recording 100 pieces from the First World War. There are over a 1,000 songs in the memorial's vast sheet music collection. Around 400 relate specifically to the Great War. So how did Teresa whittle the list down to 100? It was really difficult because I was trying to find strong stories or stories in the collection that mention a particular song, starting with the diaries making a list of the songs and then seeing whether we had it in the collection and then if we had it in the collection, whether it was out of copyright. So that ruled out quite a few songs, so we narrowed it down to 100. Music was a huge part of people's lives during the war, from sing-alongs at home to fundraising performances, from concerts on the dock to farewell soldiers and as a way to lift morale on the front line. This is the era of parlour music so people were used to singing around a piano and singing as groups a lot of choral music and a lot of that sort of style of music it was all designed to sing as a group and that sort of translated into the first world war through um, the adoption of some of these musical songs and some of the songs from home to encourage people to sing together and share share their experiences through song the men would used to have these sing-alongs um, mostly it was behind the lines um, but there are accounts of singing in the trenches the most famous example is the um, singing I Want to Go Home, which was written by a Canadian soldier and taken on very much so by the British soldiers who um, were singing it in the front lines and singing it so much that the Germans actually wrote it down and got it translated and published in a newspaper. When first I joined the army not so very long ago I said I'd fight the foe and help Sir Douglas Haig, you know been in France just 16 months and fighting now as yet. I haven't seen a German, all I've seen is mud and wet. Tomorrow when the officer asked what would you like to do, I'm going to stand right up and say if it's all the same to you. The memorial's copy of the sheet music for this song originally belonged to Private Ernest Nichols. You can see his name stamped in the top right-hand corner of the front cover. Music was also played to welcome soldiers home. There was a soldier called Ray Membry who had been a POW of the Germans during the war and when he got off the boat Um, In England, after being a POW, the band on the dock was playing Torchlight Parade March and he was like, I've played this heaps of times, hundreds of times before the war. So it brought back memories for him of a song that he already knew. Yeah, he'd been in community bands before the First World War.
there's a hundred pieces here that uh, exists only really as paper, and most people can't read music and hear it in their head. It's a very, it's a very small percentage of the population, so it's important to get them actually recorded. Chris Latham has joined us in Teresa's office. He's the director of the Flowers of War project and the memorial's first musical artist in residence. And the initial project was that the first thing I would do for the War Memorial was record these 100 songs. It was an enormous amount of work. I've got to say it was one of the, the more difficult things I've ever done in my life in terms of stamina. <laughs> what was particularly difficult about it? Well, it's just, it's a lot. It's, you're doing them four at a time, so it's 25 days in a recording studio, then 25 days of editing. It just took so long. I mean, you're just chipping away four at a time, and... Uh, there's a sort of an emotional stamina that's required because some of the songs are very beautiful and they were easy to do. And they're the songs that usually are about some kind of emotional event, often the separation from a loved one, a mother, uh, a fiancé, something like that. And they tend to be sung by soldiers as a cathartic process. What was very difficult, though, was the ones that were really propaganda songs because one of the things as musicians, we don't actually want to promote the sort of thing that propaganda songs promote, uh, you know, encouraging young men to go overseas and, and fight in a war, it's problematic um, because it's being written by older people who are encouraging these younger people to go through emotion and through music and, you know, the, through a lot of persuasion that, that looks like from the outside that it might have been very difficult to say no to. I just remember there were real moral quandaries about should we really be singing songs which emphasise, for example, the white Australia policy? You know, we all recognised that they were historical and we wanted to do it, and we all did it to the best of our ability, but there were moments where I remember thinking, this is a very hard thing to ask musicians to do. We left our homes in Australia With our people's hopes and prayers To fight for that glorious freedom Which we knew was always theirs To strike a blow for Britain and upon Australia's name All the way from the Commonwealth To Gallipoli we came. We're rifling through old copies of sheet music that Teresa and Chris have spread across the table. This is a copy of the sheet music for a song called Anzacs Well Done that was written by Sergeant William Darwin of the 7th Battalion and music by Charles Wood Dunkley, uh, which seems to be the pseudonym for Ambrose Gregory. The cover of this music uh, has a photograph of William Darwin wearing a great coat and carrying a cane and a hat with a feather in it, yeah. I think it's supposed to somehow represent military uniform. So this song is described on the front cover as a stirring military march song. It discusses how Australian soldiers have participated in the Gallipoli campaign and emphasises when they come home, people are going to say to them, Anzac's well done. William Darwin wrote Anzac's well done as a poem while he was recovering in Scotland from wounds he'd received at Gallipoli. The words were later set to music. I think this one still had charm. Uh, which wasn't the case with all of these propaganda kind of, you know, uh, this is not a recruiting song per se, but it's it's still a little bit in that vein, uh, somewhat jingoistic. But it, it's very it's very pleasing. I thought it was a good song, and uh, yes, this was this was a pleasure definitely to record. It's a patriotic song, but it's done a lot more subtly than some of the other songs. But um, it's a story behind William Darwin that actually fascinates me with this one. <laughs> Tell us about that. So William Darwin, he was um, a very interesting person. He was working at the Bendigo Hospital before he enlisted and a lot of the reports that have been written about him actually say that he was one of the first men from Bendigo to enlist but then there is actually a 1919 newspaper article which says that he was the first man in Australia to enlist in the AIF. Wow. <laughs> yeah. He was in the 7th Battalion Band after he enlisted. He was in a lot of community bands before he went and he carried that on during the war. I think he was a trumpet player. In a letter published in the Bendigo Independent newspaper in October 1916, an anonymous Anzac recovering from wounds in London praised Darwin's bravery and kindness. The first thing that made me take a liking to Sergeant Darwin was when the 7th Battalion were down at Cape Hellas, Gallipoli, where he did some splendid work. I saw him jump over the parapet and risk his life to save a wounded Turk who was lying in the danger zone under heavy fire. He went out and got that Turk he may be thankful today for Darwin saving him. 
instead of the boys in the trench putting another bullet into him. When back at Anzac, I had the luck to speak to him and tell him just what I thought of him for what he had done to save that Turk. And all he said was, well, that is nothing. I have no mother or father nor anyone that would miss me if I were knocked out. But that old Turk may have a wife and a lot of little children to take care of him. Also, poor old mother and father waiting for him to return. Just because he is one of the enemy, we must not treat him as dirt, for he is a man the same as I am. He then told me not to worry over what little thing he'd done. But I can tell you, I have seen him do things that have made my blood boil. And if some of the dead could only speak, they too would be able to tell you a lot more. At one time, when the battalion was in the rest camp just behind the firing line, we were made to do some drill. The Turks saw them and shelled the place, killing and wounding a lot of our men. Darwin was seen by all of us to go out under heavy shell fire and bring them in one by one until he had them all safe. One shell was seen to burst between his legs, but it did not hurt him. He was up and at it again, getting the men into safety. Teresa's discovered that Darwin's adventures and generous exploits continued after the war. He was on the afternoon train, I think it was in December 1916, that he got back to Bendigo. He joined up the community bands again. In about 1920, he decided to go overseas and write more songs, but he did it the roundabout way. He went to New Zealand, then he went to Hawaii, then he went to Vancouver, um, and then he went to England. I think it was in New Zealand that he rescued two women who were drowning and he couldn't swim, but he rescued them and he got a, got recognised for that. Then he got to Vancouver and he rescued something like seven people from a burning building there, um, got recognised for that again. And so by the time he got to England, he'd had quite a few adventures. But then he came back to Australia about 1924 and realised that um, women's pipe bands couldn't enter competitions in Australia. So he went around fundraising for them and then went overseas with them um, so that they could compete. And then later in life, in the 1970s, um, he got involved with the Footscray Yarraville band in Melbourne and convinced them that they were good enough to win a competition. He sent them over to Toronto and they won three competitions there. <laughs> so he was an all-around good guy. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good way to summarise him, yeah. You're listening to Collected, stories from the Australian War Memorial, I'm Louise Ma. This song is called A Perfect Day. It was written by American singer and songwriter Carrie Jacobs Bond in 1909 and published the following year. Carrie actually wrote it when she was visiting friends in California. She was getting dressed for dinner and watching the sunset out through the window of where she was staying and she just wrote three verses of the song as that was going on. The song emphasises friendship and getting to the end of like a, having spent a perfect day with great friends. When the sun Carrie Jacobs Bond had realised that people wanted sentimental songs but the publishers at the time weren't publishing those sort of songs, so she decided to open up her own music publishing business. And as part of that, she was also quite a talented artist and she'd been painting ceramics. Her signature was sort of roses. And so this piece of music up in the left-hand corner has a, quite an intricate pattern of or design featuring roses and other flowers. Why did this song become popular in the First World War? I think the, the song became popular because of the lyrics. It was a song that was very popular before the beginning of the First World War, so it just carried on its popularity through the First World War. The lyrics struck a chord with the soldiers. It was just something that reminded them of home. It was that link. Most songs of this type are written for piano and voice, and this is unusual because it has a cello. 
It's not very rare to have an instrument, but what is very rare is to have people who are singing in the low part of the register as well as a low instrument, because this is actually written for baritone. So you have two instruments that are very, uh, a voice and an instrument that are very much in the same register. It's the only one I know like that. And it gives it this very rich quality. And so one of the things you think when you listen to it is just how beautiful it is, as well as the, the words which are very beautiful. It's an extremely lovely tune. So this is Just a Khaki Soldier and a Little Maid. Uh, it was written at Christmas 1914 by someone called Victoria, which uh, we've worked out was a pseudonym for someone from Melbourne called Lily Bell. It's a story of a couple who have to say goodbye because the soldier is going off to war. All the motives in the song are Australian flora or fauna, that sort of thing, and the lyrics are just beautiful with the imagery that they paint. As Teresa explains, this song is also somewhat of a mystery. It doesn't appear that this song was actually ever published. The copyright um, was granted to Lily Bell in 1915. The copy that we have um, has been copied out by hand and the research that I've done into it suggests that it was never published. So you don't know whether anyone ever really played it or sang it? No, uh, unfortunately no, Um, which is sad because it's a beautiful song. Do you know how it came to be in the War Memorial? No, that I don't know either. I haven't been able to track that story. I have to say that when we first started, we had very low expectations because it looked very simple. And it was totally mesmerising. And I have no idea how to describe it other than it was like we went into a dream and about an hour later we came out of it. And then we had this very unusually beautiful recording. And... The material is utterly simple and repeats over and over again, but there's something in it that is very true. And this was one of these cases where you really feel like you're bringing something to light that deserves actually consideration, partially because there's very little Australian that is something that really speaks about Australia. So much of it is British. Even the people who are writing saying that, you know, we're very proud to be British living in Australia. But this is entirely something that I could relate to. The things you can only find here. song um, that was written by Mae Summerbell with lyrics written by John Barr. The cover of this song is a little bit different to most of the other pieces. It's um, a brown coloured background and up the top it has an inset copy of the red ensign of the Australian flag. And what does it say up here? Dedicated? It says dedicated to Australia's expeditionary forces and played by the principal bands of the Commonwealth. And if we open it up We can see on the inside page there's an inscription by the composer. It's written in pencil and it's a little bit difficult to read but it does say this music was held by the Second Light Horse Band and was played on 17 May 1915 as the troops left Egypt. So the song was written in 1914. May Summerbell was a Australian composer at the time who it was felt by those people writing about her music that if she lived overseas she would have got a lot more attention. Her piano teacher was the same teacher as Dame Nellie Melba and May Summerbell did actually write pieces of music specifically for Dame Nellie Melba. When John Seuss's band visited Australia, the band played some of her pieces and John Sousa really liked her music. She actually sang this song um, with one of the well-known singers in Australia at the time at the Concord Club in Sydney. 
the um, performer was Sydney MacDonald and they performed it on the 10th of September 1914. So it was written very early in the war. So how would you describe this song? Uh, it's a march and it's specifically written for the first 20,000 uh, soldiers who've left Australia. It's very much of a farewell song. The lyrics actually talk about how once they've been away to war, um, how they'll be needed to come back home afterwards. It covers off both bases, like farewell to the war, but we're going to welcome you when you come home. And we can see that this sheet music has been repaired at some stage too. Yeah, it's actually been reinforced around the edges. So that would have been to protect it? Yeah, to make it a, li a bit more sturdier to prevent future damage. For a march, this is more interesting than normal. It's notable because it has these very large intervals. And so an interval is when instead of it being a step, like most songs will just move by a step, it has a big jump. And it takes a certain amount of talent to be able to do that. So this is probably written for a professional singer. I liked it a lot. I thought it was a good one. Often these ones are the ones that date the worst, and this one didn't. I felt it had some kind of, you know, there's, there's something about it that's a classic. Music and the First World War has been a huge project. Researching, cataloguing, digitising, and professionally recording 100 pieces to produce a rich online collection. So what does curator Teresa Cronk think of these songs now? A lot of these songs, um, they were good pieces of music at the time and listening to them now, they're still good pieces of music. There are some that are very much a product of their time, but those ones aside, the, the bulk of these, although they've been forgotten in many ways, um, bringing them out now, it's still good music. Yeah. What have you most enjoyed about working on the project? Uncovering the stories behind the songs, it's been really fascinating. Some of the big stories that have come out of it that I didn't actually know, A Perfect Day being one example. Um, 1938, it was described as the song of the 20th century and we don't know about it now. So it was stories like that and the story behind the composer of that one being the first female composer to make a million dollars from her music. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's a lot of money. <laughs> and Chris, what about you? What is what is it working on this project meant for you? I find that it's very touching how much music is how important music is to soldiers. It's part of the way they recover emotionally and the the desensitizing of the war experience. They instinctively try to sing very emotional songs in order to get a return to feeling. And as a musician, I'm, I'm gratified by that, you know, to see that it's really important. It also, it gives a chance for people at home to somehow share in the experience. While they're, it's, they're not real, right? These are their attempt to imagine what it's like and they're woefully inaccurate. But they are trying in some way to kind of be with their boys overseas through playing these songs in their houses. And one of the things we've got to remember is there is no radio. There's no record player unless you're very wealthy. And there's very few CD, uh, 78s that have been made at this stage. So... Um, if you want to make music, you have to make it yourself. And that's also really important because there are no recordings of these pieces. So, you know, doing the work is doing the work for the first time. The Second World War, the songs were all on the radio and the songs were all being recorded and sold as records, but that's not the case here. There were so many, I think of the 100 songs, maybe I didn't know 90 of them. I mean, there were some that I had some knowledge of the title or the tune was vaguely familiar. Alan Hicks, the pianist, his grandfather was a pianist and so they had a lot of singing in the family and so he had remembered more than I did but very much it's oral tra tradition that it's it has been written down but it, at the time it would have been something that you really would have had to be there to hear it we don't exactly know how they sang them in those trenches and sing-alongs we'll never know that but what we were trying to do was find something that was emotionally true so pack up your troubles in your old kit bag and smile Thanks for listening to this episode of Collected, stories from the Australian War Memorial. I'm Louise Ma. You can subscribe to the series by going to the Memorial's website or wherever you get your podcasts. See you next time. Mm -hmm.